so happy she's here. She is an amazing person. She's a cardiologist. She works very closely here, she probably will say. Uh, she's a professor in cardiology and she is an amazing speaker. If you have been, if you like TED Talk, she has been on the TED Talk. She's talking about One Health principles. Uh, she is a cardiologist, but she's also a psychiatrist. That's a scary combination. But her parents were psychiatrists, and so it goes down the line. Either, she said, in her family you can choose between two jobs. Either be a psychiatrist or a cardiologist. She's a wonderful person, she's an amazing speaker, and I'm very, very lucky that we have her here, because uh, she's speaking all over the world. Barbara, please take the stage and uh, wow us with your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Thank you. This is really fun. Wow. I mean, I, live, I have lived in L.A. my entire life. I think I'm going to step forward as instructed. And I've never been here. This is a gorgeous place. So um, anyway, for those of you who are not from L.A., welcome to L.A. So I'm excited to be here. Um, what I want to talk to you about is some ideas that I have about how I think veterinary science can transform human medicine and how veterinarians can really help physicians understand the human animals that are under their care. So let's, let's take it away. of a five-day trip from England, the Queen Elizabeth, world's largest ocean liner, pulls into New York Harbor. Aboard are almost 15,000 happy GIs, most of them men of the 8th Air Force, jamming every square inch of deck space for a look at the USA. So at the end of World War II, tens of thousands of GIs came streaming back home. And they were coming from Asia, from Europe. These were guys who had survived Omaha Beach. They had survived Iwo Jima. But they were, they came home and they were dying like flies of another killer. And that was heart disease. So back then, we didn't know a lot of the things that we now all take for granted. For example, back in the late 1940s, we didn't know that high blood pressure was a risk factor for heart disease. And in fact, this famous picture that everyone recognizes with Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt at Yalta, well, Roosevelt's personal physician kept a diary, and at this meeting, his blood pressure was 236 over 124. This was FDR. He was that hypertensive, and in fact, he died several months later after Yalta of a stroke. Back then, we didn't know that a sedentary lifestyle and being overweight were risk factors for heart disease. Back then, we didn't know that having diabetes or an elevated blood sugar in general was a risk factor for heart disease. And back then, everybody smoked. Scientists smoked, teachers smoked, doctors smoked. Lots of doctors. In fact, when I started my residency at UCLA, on the cardiology suite, we had this long, long floor, and there were these old um, chart racks. So back in, before we had I, you know, iPads, we had everything on a chart rack. And on top of the chart racks were little, um, you could see a little indentation where years before there had been ashtrays. And my mentors both used to chain smoke on rounds. So, you know, in fact, um, everybody smoked. And I had to add this because I am completely in love with Don Draper and I could watch him smoke. Yes, I know, <laughs> yeah. Well, a group of doctors um, decided to get together and figure out why so many people were dying of heart disease. They were, sudden death was the leading cause of death at that point. And so they decided they were gonna look at a seemingly intractable medical problem and try to figure it out by switching their perspective, by looking at it through a different prism. And so what they did was to devise a study 
to look longitudinally, prospectively, at risk factors. And this was something that had never been done before. They conceived of the now very famous Framingham trial, where thousands of men and women from this small town in Massachusetts started going to the doctor every few months where their blood pressure was checked, where they were asked, what are you eating? They were asked, how much stress are you under? What is your blood sugar? They would you know, have their EKGs done and all kinds of things. And over the course of several years, and now several decades, we learned that high blood pressure and diabetes and elevated cholesterol and a sedentary lifestyle and smoking, et cetera, et cetera, were risk factors for having a heart attack and a stroke. And in fact, Framingham, the results of Framingham, this shifted perspective, have served as the basis for preventative medicine today. So this was a, a very important success story, and it came about because a group of scientific leaders decided to look at something from a different perspective. But it has not been a complete success story, because heart disease, despite the interventions from Framingham, remains the leading cause of death in the United States. One in three deaths in the U.S is caused by heart disease. And for women, a group that has been overlooked in terms of heart disease, if you take a look at the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth causes of death and you add them all up, more women are still dying of heart disease. So Framingham helped, but it hasn't been complete. And so what I'm gonna submit to you today is that human medicine, again, needs to be transformed by a shifted perspective by an expanded perspective. And I submit to you that I believe that expanded perspective will come from veterinary medicine, will come from your profession teaching my profession how to think comparatively, something that we, is not part of the fabric of what we do, whereas it is for you. So, I propose that for my colleagues, Learning about an Egyptian vulture flying 5,000 feet above a mountain range. Learning that these animals can develop, spontaneously develop, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, plaque, heart attack, and stroke, like many other taxa of both captive and wild birds, that that knowledge alone should spark the kinds of questions that can create hypotheses that lead to science, that lead to innovation. Veterinary knowledge, comparative knowledge, can transform human medicine. Okay, so, um, how are we gonna do this? Well, to tell you how I think we should do it, I wanna go back and tell you my story, because um, in a million years, I never thought that I would be standing at this point in my career talking to a group of veterinarians. And I'm gonna be completely honest as I tell this story. Veterinary medicine was not on my radar at all. At all. And I say that honestly, and I'm gonna share my ignorance because I think it's shared by a lot of my colleagues. Okay, so what is my story? So about, you know, for the last, oh, well, over 25 years, I've been at UCLA, I've been a cardiologist, and you know, I take care of patients with heart attacks and high cholesterol. And actually, um, about 15 years ago or so, I was focused pretty much on cardiac imaging and was working on a project using ultrasound when I got a call from one of the veterinarians here at Griffith Park at the local LA Zoo, asking if I would come and do some cardiac imaging on some of their great apes. And um, as all of you know, you know, the zoos are staffed by board certified fantastic vets, but for their grade eight patients, they often ask for um, human cardiologists to come and do echoes. So I was really excited. I went over here to this animal health and conservation center. And I actually remember one of the first patients I took care of was a chimp who they thought had had a neurological situation. And you gotta know that for me, like I did transesophageal echoes all day long at UCLA, and this was one of the most thrilling experiences in the world to go to the zoo and to do this procedure on this chimp. But the thing that really blew me away was that I, I slid my probe down, I turned around and I looked at the echo, 
And what I saw here was a four-chambered beating heart but immediately I noticed biatrial enlargement, I noticed thickening of the walls of the LV and the RV, the right ventricle, and of course everybody is staring at these balls that are moving uh, at the mouth of the tricuspid valve in the right atrium. And these of course are blood clots. And as I looked at this combination of, of enlargement and thickening and I compared it in my mind to an echo that I had done on a human patient um, uh, some months before, I realized that they probably had the same condition. And in that moment, I was excited and surprised. And I'm saying this to you today because I'm completely embarrassed that I was so excited and surprised. And it's that disconnect between how can I have been a professor for 20 years at a major medical center, and by the way, I worked in evolutionary biology as an undergraduate and a graduate student, and yet there was this disconnect in my head between the animals that humans, the, the diseases that humans get and that animals get. And anyway, that is sort of the basis of, of this whole spark and in my interest. Anyway, the zoo experience was fantastic. I got to go to the zoo and rule out a torn aorta in a gorilla. I got to listen for heart murmurs uh, in a macaw. Um, look for constrictive pericarditis in a sea lion. And this is a picture of Cookie, who was our lioness at the LA Zoo. She was a geriatric lioness. She was wonderful. But she developed um, about 700 cc's of fluid in her pericardium. And we coordinated this really great uh, collaborative procedure involving veterinary surgeons and human cardiologists and anesthesiologists, this team, and we drained her pericardium. Um, and I show this picture to groups of medical students and physicians and everyone, of course, laughs when they see the tail on the paw. And then I describe the procedure and I say, you know, it's the identical procedure. And as many of you know, for many physicians, that's very surprising, which is interesting. All right, so I started getting really interested in One Health. And I learned about One Health, and I went to One Health lectures. And what, I was, what was coming out of the One Health world, for the most part, and what I started lecturing about was the important role that animals played in disease transmission, particularly diseases that had high impact on human communities. And of course, I talked about what we all are aware of, the important role of the animal reservoir uh, as a source of infections for the human world. And I talked about this to groups of medical students and interns and residents and colleagues. And I mentioned that the father of our field, Sir William Osler, is also considered the father, one of the fathers of veterinary medicine. In fact, coined the term One Medicine and was one of the founders of McGill's School of Veterinary Medicine. And of course, I shared with my colleagues the famous quote that all of you know. Rudolf Virchow, who was one of Osler's teachers, wrote in the 19th century, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained contains, constitutes the basis of all medicine. I was so excited about this. And I was presenting, and what I expected was that because I was so turned on by this whole thing. I, I just felt like I, I had discovered this world. But what I got from my colleagues was a lot more like this. And um, I was puzzled because I was so excited about what I was learning when I was going to the zoo and listening to the veterinarians on rounds and reading the veterinary literature. And I began realizing that the problem the problem was that what was coming out of One Health, the world of One Health at that time, didn't feel relevant to most physicians. Most physicians are pediatricians and cardiologists and OBGYNs and dermatologists and neurologists. They're not public health doctors. They're not infectious disease doctors. Of course, it's good that we have public health officials and ID docs, but most physicians they're busy, they're taking care of their patients. And so I began wondering if the reason I was so turned on by veterinary medicine was that I was encountering diseases that I was seeing in my human patients. And I wondered whether we could begin exposing my community, my professional community to veterinary medicine in a way that would really make them see the connection. So, I created a little rubric for myself and for my colleagues. And I started giving lectures first at UCLA, 
and then beyond, where to groups of physicians and medical students where I would ask these questions. And by the way, this was based on a, a database that I started keeping of um, if I saw a condition in a human patient, I would look for it in the veterinary literature. And so I asked, do animals get breast and prostate cancer, dilated cardiomyopathy? By the way, this is a slide intended for colleagues at an academic medical center. And so what I wanted to do was to really drive home that these you know, important human conditions you know, had this comparative perspective. So this is the slide or similar slides I would show. You know, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, congenital heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, infertility, STDs, atrial fibrillation, asthma, allergy, concussion, autoimmune disorders, melanoma, glioblastoma, high impact human problems that they were seeing every single day and that are you know, densely studied in the, in the literature. And what happened and was happening, and, and it continues to happen, although a little bit less, I think, in the last few years, is that when I would click and show this, the room would start talking. And they'd be, you know, you hear that noise in a crowd when there's like a response. This was news to most of them. And my guess is many of you have had clients who are physicians who are surprised when you say that, you know, Bongo has a seizure disorder or that, um, you know, Nelly has breast cancer, that these seem to be human diseases, not if you've had that experience with a physician client. Many people have. Um, I also looked at behavioral disorders because these things seem to be so uniquely human, quote unquote. And of course, do animals develop separation anxiety, compulsion, self-injury, eating problems, cognitive decline with age, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone here knows the answer is yes. But when I present this to groups of psychiatrists and psychotherapists and teachers and others who deal with human patients with these issues, tremendous surprise. So here was an opportunity. So what did I do? So back when I started to get a little bit of a clue that if we want to engage the human community in veterinary medicine, if we want to have a chance of transforming our field and enhancing and expanding how we understood medicine, we needed to begin talking about veterinary problems, quote unquote, as human problems and human problems as veterinary problems to really create the concept of the human animal. So um, one example of how I did this was to use um, things that were in the news. So when, when Steve Jobs, um, you know, tragically and prematurely passed away, the New York Times wrote an obituary and referred to his neuroendocrine tumor as rare. On several occasions, it's been referred to as rare. And of course, it is rare in humans, fortunately, but it's not rare in the world of patients because there are animal patients, ferrets and certain dog breeds that commonly get this. And the point of doing that was to spark this idea that maybe there was something we could learn from how veterinarians and veterinary science approaches this issue in non-human animals. A similar approach, um, this is a picture over here of, does anybody recognize who this is? Whoops, oh, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, does anybody recognize who this person is? Yes, that's Ted Kennedy. And do you know who that is? Do you remember? That was his son. So, so, so I, I remember when I was 12 years old, my dad, who was a doc, uh, told me about a 12-year-old boy who had developed bone cancer and that he had had to have an amputation. And I remember that conversation very well. Well, of course, Ted Kennedy's son had developed osteosarcoma. And so when we, there was a case of osteosarcoma at the hospital, I would talk to my colleagues about this and make the connection to you know, the many species of animals and, of course, dog breeds that are vulnerable. And so on and so forth. Human diseases, quote unquote, not so uniquely human. So what is the issue? So the issue, the limitation in advancing this concept of integrating our fields to enhancing my field by becoming educated about your field, here are the limitations. 
First, physicians for the most part have pretty limited awareness of the overlap in pathology between humans and animals. That's a big problem. Number two, there's a limited awareness of the scope of veterinary clinical issues. What veterinarians take care of? Many physicians are unaware of veterinary specialization and subspecialization. So this is, a, this is a problem as well. And by the way, I'm airing the dirty laundry here. I'm, I'm sharing what the problem is because we're not going to be able to do anything about it if we don't know what's going on. Also, a lot of physicians, it's changing, don't understand about veterinary education. Uh, many, many physicians don't know that vet school is basically the same as medical school, that it's harder to get into vet school than medical school, and it's basically impossible to get into medical school. And many don't know about residencies, um, so specialization, as I mentioned. What worries me most, though, is that most physicians have not yet become aware that looking for natural animal models of human health and of, uh, well, for animal health and animal disease is a cue, a clue for understanding human disease. And finally, physicians are highly ignorant of the opportunities for collaboration and for the kind of innovative, transformational, translational medicine that can come through collaboration with veterinarians. And so my mission has become to address these issues because I really believe, as I said before, that we can transform scientifically and clinically how we understand the human animal by engaging veterinary medicine. So step one was to make these issues, make One Health relevant to the, the average physician, the family medicine doc, right, the pediatrician. Number two, we have to demonstrate how having comparative knowledge can actually lead to novel hypotheses and an expanded perspective. Here are a few examples. There is probably no issue that's of greater concern and greater fear to most women than breast cancer. And of course, we all know as clinicians, as scientists, that a breast is a breast is a breast, if you're a mammal, pretty much. And of course, that is true whether you are a polar bear in the Canadian Arctic, whether you are <clears throat> an African elephant. I love this picture. <laughs> a breast is a breast is a breast. And of course, as I point out to my colleagues, breast cancer has been found, spontaneously occurring cases of breast cancer has been found in many, many, many species of mammals, from marine mammals to marsupials. And of course, we know that big cats seem to have some increased tendency to developing breast cancer, mammary carcinoma. This idea, this fact, this information should be of huge interest to oncologists and to women health experts. And in fact, one really fascinating uh, uh, connection that I'm lecturing on and trying to encourage research around um, is this idea of increased vulnerability. Angelina Jolie, everyone knows, probably the most uh, you know, famous movie star in the world, she went public about three years ago with the fact that she carries a mutation called the BRCA1 mutation. Is everybody aware? Did everyone hear about this? So she, I think very courageously, went public to say she was going to have a prophylactic mastectomy because she had this family history of this devastating disease because she carried a mutation of the BRCA1 gene. Well, it turns out the elevated risk for breast cancer that we see in certain big cats, including jaguars, in some cases is also attributed to this BRCA1 mutation. So this is a kind of connection when I present this to groups of oncologists that is startling to them. The reason I pointed out, I'm not an oncologist, I'm not a basic scientist, but the reason I pointed out is that I don't know what kinds of hypotheses can come from this information, but I do know that it is not a very good idea scientifically to live in a silo, and it's not a good idea scientifically to be unaware of comparative information. So this has actually turned out to be, this slide, a very um, kind of powerful calling card for this idea. But there are many other 
connections, um, lactation. We know that breastfeeding is so important for human health, and yet there are so many barriers to lactation. And there's so much knowledge about lactation in the world of, of agricultural veterinary medicine, and so many opportunities for collaboration um, for women's health. And of course, this was the cover of Newsweek several months ago, looking at natural animal models for health and disease is a way we can transform how we think scientifically about seemingly, seemingly intractable human medical problems. Here's one from my field. So one day I went to the zoo and um, there was a project, a number of the tamarin at the zoo had developed heart failure and several of them had actually had sudden death. And so the vets asked if I'd come and do some echoes on the tamarin just to see whether any of them had reduced systolic function and if they did, we'd put them on the same you know, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers that would do for our human patients. And one of the days that I came, um, I was doing an echo on a, an emperor tamarin, and you know I was examining. I, I came up a little bit too close, I guess, my physician ignorance, and I was I was being a little too intense with the animal. And the vet just kind of casually said, "Hey, you know what, Barb? Back off a little bit. You're you're you, know, you have to give this animal space. That you know you're scaring her." And mentioned the term capture myopathy, which I'd never heard before. Anyway. I went on to learn about capture myopathy, which of course is kind of an umbrella term for, you know, animals who are, you know, who develop rhabdo and develop all kinds of problems when they're being chased. But it turns out there is a subset of patients, of animal patients who have capture myopathy, who, when they are terrified, when they're being chased and when they're being restrained, have this massive catecholamine dump, this high levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they experience acute heart failure. And that's been seen in animals ranging from tamarin to uh, hoof stock to um, you know, prong, these are, this is, I love this picture of these pronghorn. Imagine the autonomic nervous system of these animals, the adrenaline, right? The vasoconstriction, the tachycardia, the increased stroke volume. Can you imagine the kind of emotional state of these animals? Now they're being chased by a helicopter. They're terrified from the sound and the noise, but this is the same scene that you would see if they were being chased by predators. And it turns out that that autonomic activation and that incidence of capture myopathy that's seen in some hoof stock, now compare the autonomic state of those animals to these animals at 9-11. And in fact, whether it's a terrorist attack or an earthquake, and this is actual, a, actually a picture um, I wanted to show you from a freeway not far from here in 1994, the date of our last major earthquake here in LA. Rates of acute heart failure and heart attacks increase after terror. And this actually was in the New England Journal of Medicine soon about a year after our earthquake that showed the rate of fear-related heart attacks. This is an interesting connection because... Oops. I'm going to pause this for a second. Oops. Can I go back? All right, before we do that, because it turns out it doesn't take a terrorist attack, it doesn't take a natural disaster for this to affect human populations. So here is this information that veterinary medicine has about capture myopathy. By the way, it's been published in the veterinary literature since at least 1971. But which was a big, which, by the way, it was news to my field. It became, it, it exploded onto the scene in about 2000. That's a whole other story of the lag. But the point is, this is a big issue, and not just when there's a terrorist attack. Because every day when people are stressed, some of them have heart attacks. This, the uh, video I want to show you actually comes from a very... Um, a famous uh, soccer game, famous because it was studied after the fact. So it was Argentina versus England, and they were in a, uh, the semifinals for the World Cup in soccer. And the two countries 15 years earlier had had that Falkland Islands war, so they kind of hated each other, and it came down to a sudden death penalty kick. 
And if, um, if England caught the goal, I mean, if Argentina got the goal, they won. And if, if England, you know, got it, they didn't. And everyone, you can imagine, you know, in England was looking at their televisions in these pubs. And this is what happened. Four, three. Batty, shot, set. Okay, Argentina wins. Now, this is a picture of people all over England. And imagine their blood pressures, right? Imagine their heart rates. And this is a picture of the coach and the kicker. And it turns out, the British Medical Journal published a year later that for 72 hours after that loss, the rate of um, heart attack, admissions for chest pain and heart attacks increased 35%, right? It's a real phenomenon. So, what's the point? The point is, these are important questions to human medicine. We know that marmots, right? You can pick up a marmot, I'm told by marmot experts, and tip them this way and tip them that way, and they're fine. They're resilient. But a pica, who lives a, maybe a couple thousand feet up, if you pick them up and hold them too tight, they can have sudden death. There is differential vulnerability to cardiac problems. Knowing this should be of huge interest to people in my field, but it won't happen if they remain ignorant about the basics of comparative medicine. What about the behavioral, biobehavioral, psychiatry, an area that I'm very interested in? Let's have a moment to talk about self-injury. You know, when I first asked the question, do animals self-injure, I thought it was a stupid question. I thought it was a completely ridiculous question because in my head, self-injury, the self-injuring patient was a teenage girl who was angry at her parents, and by the way, ignorant, angry at her parents, who was cutting in her room. Okay, I, I, that's what I thought it was. I thought it was absolutely crazy that there would be a comparative perspective. And of course, boy, was I wrong. I also thought of compulsions as being something which were highly humanoid. Of course, everybody here has seen cases of a tail-chasing dog with severe canine compulsive disorder or a flank-sucking Doberman, right? These are problems that you see. But when I show this to groups of physicians, it is transformational for them. They are blown away that these issues are not unique to humans. And in fact, it's been exciting to suggest that feather plucking in a bird and how veterinarians conceive of why that happens and how they intervene to make things better, that that formulation could be applied to a human patient with trichotillomania, this terrible hair plucking compulsion that disfigures mostly girls and young women. Well, sorry for the gruesome photo, but I think these connections have the potential to transform how we understand human psychopathology. What about postpartum depression? Postpartum depression fortunately isn't common, but we do see it in some per small percentage of women after they have a baby. We know now that it represents a disruption in the pituitary, uh, hypothalamic, ac hypothalamic access. There are some genetic components to it. It's highly stigmatized, by the way. When things go well between mother and offspring, it's beautiful. That axis works, that oxytocin, that hypothalamus, that whole pituitary picture. Mother and baby are content. We see when it works well bonding as the offspring grows up. And we see that good bonding between mother and offspring leads to care and tenacious uh, hang in there. I love this slide. Yes, right? <laughs> but, but, and this is not a foal, but I, I couldn't find a picture of the foal rejection syndrome. There is a syndrome in veterinary medicine that I've learned about in my journey. It happens more in paints and Arabians, but certain breeds of horses, under certain conditions, certain mares, will not allow their foal to nurse. And in some cases, they'll kick that foal and damage that foal, and in some cases, even injure and kill that foal. 
And this, interestingly, probably represents, I believe, a natural animal model for postpartum depression psychosis in human, in women. And interestingly, I have learned about some fascinating ways that equine veterinarians deal with this problem, ways that I deeply believe could be translated to the human side. Even as I say this, and I've said this probably 50 times, I get a chill thinking about it. This is a high-impact human problem. You have all read those terrible cases where women hurt and sometimes actually even kill their children. And these were not all bad people. These were good people who had this terrible disease. That this information, this insight, this approach is sequestered in veterinary medicine, I think is this close to being immoral based on a kind of... Um, professional arrogance in my field, and a medical form of human exceptionalism. Um, all right, finally. When it comes to mental illness, whether it's self-injury, whether it is obsessive-compulsive disorder, whether it is postpartum depression, human patients who have mental illness very often don't get, don't get care. They don't get care because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, their communities don't support it, they hide. Stigma is the number one issue that the National Institutes of Mental Health is concerned about. And I believe by educating the world of human medicine to the veterinary um, aspects of psychopathology, we could begin working on that issue of stigma. All right. Step three, scientifically, let's collaborate. There is a typical definition for translational medicine, which is always, let's go from the bench to the bedside. And when you say translational medicine, what do you think? You think about someone doing basic science, doing some micro-inspection, some gel, some, something, some PCR, something very, very basic, and then ultimately developing a hypothesis and making it relevant to a clinical patient. But what if, sitting here today, we propose that there's another way to be translational? And that is actually, it represents the elastic recoil back from this nano-inspection. And that is instead to look across species, to look across the world, to look for commonalities, and from those commonalities across species, generate hypotheses that lead to science that then can be brought to the bedside. Translational medicine is more than just basic science. It is comparative medicine, and it's collaboration with our sister field of veterinary medicine. So step four, how the hell are we going to do this? <laughs> I mean, I, from the day that I first went to the zoo, which was now probably, uh, probably about 13, 14 years ago, um, I have been captivated and challenged to bring these ideas to my profession. And there are some barriers. There's a lot of arrogance. There's a lot of ignorance. And ultimately, what there really is, is human exceptionalism. And so what can we do about that? Well, I'm trying my best. Um, when Oh, I wrote this book called Zubiquity, which is how this all was launched, and I got an advance from the publisher, and so I used money from the advance. Um, Catherine Bowers, by the way, is my co-author in this. We've done all of the research and writing together, but we used this money to fund these Zubiquity conferences, which were basically an attempt to just bring together veterinary car cardiologists and human cardiologists, psychiatrists and, and behaviorists, and so we've done that. This was our first. This was Dean Benny Osborne from Davis and the dean of UCLA Medical School. Deans of vet schools, deans of medical schools, faculty of vet schools, faculty of medical schools. And our Zubiquity conferences have now been in Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, Boston. We just had one at UPenn uh, about a month ago. It's an attempt to create a living laboratory. I believe that human medicine could be transformed through veterinary science. And that will benefit not just the human beings that I take care of, my colleagues take care of, but all the patients on the planet. So it's a tall order. Um, 
when I first proposed this whole idea to my boss at UCLA, he shook his head and he said, you're, you're going to waste your career doing this. And at that point, I, I was a scary thing to hear, but I look back now, and he's a wonderful guy, and I, I admire him deeply. But I think there has been such a narrow idea of what it means to understand health that as we move into this world of thinking ecologically and thinking in an expanded way, we really have a shot of making it happen. So collaborate with colleagues, collaborate with physicians. When you have clients who are physicians, bring them in. And I'm going to work on my end along with my colleagues to bring um, as many of you guys um, into my world. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take some questions. All right. Can I have the mic on? Isn't this lady fantastic? <laughs> I just want to say, thanks, Barb. Amazing. Oh, so, thank you. I think you're so inspiring. And, you know, as you said, mm -hmm. a lot of the veterinarians always think that they know the answer. But uh, it's fantastic that we have someone on the other side thinking the same thing. So wonderful. Sure. Thank you. We have, as a matter of fact, quite a lot of time for questions. And Barb has to leave because she has to give a class <laughs> for students at 11. So, uh, so if you have any questions, it's right now. She has her book. Uh, she has signed her book, as a matter of fact. And the book is available outside. So if you want her book, if you haven't read it, it's definitely a number one on your list, reading list. And uh, is it also digital? Available? Yay! Yeah, it's, yeah. it's also digital for our millennials, so that's great. <laughs> so, uh, but I have found out that there are a couple of non millennials here too, Barb, so well, they will just buy your book, that's... which is fantastic. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, if you wait one second until the microphone is there, and then uh, we prefer the microphone because then we can hear it, uh, and, and we're here with the world, so the world would like to hear your question too. Okay, uh, what veterinary groups are you inviting or integrating with the Zubiquity conferences? Right, so we, um, ev our conferences are intended to be, uh, what my, my dream is to have as many uh, groups in, involved with each one. We start with a vet school. So typically, the dean of a vet school approaches us and says, hey, we want to do a Zubiquity conference. And then, um, depending on what other groups want to participate, like for Philly, we had, so UPenn, so Joan Hendricks, who's the dean, she, she sort of said, let's do it here. And then the Pennsylvania Veterinary Medical Association came on. And then we had... Um, local groups, but, but PVMA and PenVet were the primary sponsors for that one. In most of our conferences, the local veterinary medical association gets pretty engaged, but the vet school is really pretty much at the hub. Because, because I'm an academic, that's sort of just the world that I know, so my approach is really to engage academic to academic. I mean, and we do, and the other thing is, of course, zo zoonoses are important. The problem is when you go to medical school, what you're taught, the only connection between human and animal health is zoonotic infection. So I tend to not do a lot of zoonoses. We do heart disease, we do biobehavioral problems, we do cancer, we do osteosarcoma, we do breast cancer, melanoma, lymphoma. Um, so, it, so the answer to your question, we typically have academic um, groups. For New York, we had the Wildlife Conservation Society, the WCS, which um, is the group that oversees the, you know, the zoos and aquarium in New York. I think there are five of them. There's the Bronx Zoo, the Central Park Zoo. Um, we had, uh, and then the vet schools. And then all of the medical schools in New York participated in that. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, wonderful. Hi, so I was fortunate enough to see a TED talk that you did on this mm -hmm. uh, when I was on an airplane, and it was exceptional. So it's better, even better to see you in person, oh. but um, a number of us here are dermatologists, and so we see and have seen for years and have invited MD dermatologists to our meetings, so mm -hmm. applaud what you're doing, and I think our specialty would be thrilled to be involved more if we can. Well, first of all, thank you for the, those nice words. Um, at our PEN conference, we did atopic dermatitis. And we had, um, 
gosh, the, the, I'm going to have a... Yes, Morris. yes, Morris, Dr. Morris, Dan Morris right. and Jennifer from University of Washington. She's a human dermatologist, and they did a, a kind of a Zuby conference-y kind of thing at the American Academy of Dermatology a few months ago. And we now are thinking we're going to do it. So derm is, but derm is a perfect example. That is not on anyone's radar. You go to medical school, there's no, there's no conversation at all. And atopic dermatitis, I know there's been some crossover drugs, and so it's actually a pretty good, um, it's a pretty good model, um, yeah. And we have the amazing Dr. Kim at the end of today. Who's chief of cardiology, at, I mean, I mean of cardiology, of dermatology. Jenny Kim is, doesn't get any better than that. Extremely so famous. So we're ending this day with, with stand, we're starting with a wonderful MD and we're ending with a wonderful MD. So just to put that link into the dermatology, the One Health, and uh, and I saw her slides. Some of them are pretty gruesome, because I think it's always so strange that <laughs> if I look at dogs with yeah. abscess and that sort of thing, so no problem. But then I look at a human with an abscess, yeah. I'm like, ee. <laughs> That's disgusting. Yeah. Well, yeah, dermatology is all about the pictures anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Oh, there. Sorry. So academics are certainly... Hi. Hey. <laughs> the bright lights. Um, academics are certainly huge, but do we have any um, big pharma that wants to get on board from the standpoint of research? You know, on the, on the, we've borrowed from the human side forever from the standpoint that you have those resources financially and, and such, the investment, but... From the veterinary side, if we could have more pharma on board to develop these things that cross over to the human side, I just wondered if anybody, if those people are on board yet. They are all interested. This is this is kind of on people's radar. I mean, I don't know that they're all interested. I, I get asked to like have consultation meetings with you know big farm human on the human side to ask the question, you know, what's going on on the veterinary side that we can draw. The problem for me is that I mean I'm a clinical cardiologist. So, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to put myself down, but I'm not, you know, I'm not the person who's going to come up with these, these, I mean, I have, am extremely fascinated by the fact that this has not happened before because it's so obvious and there's so much aware of it on the veterinary side and so much ignorance on the human side. It's like one of these hiding in plain sight things. So I think there has to be my hope for, that what I'm doing will spark my colleagues who, who know about how you create, you know, how pharma works to to answer the questions, but definitely, I mean, I get invitations to go to Genentech and Sanofi. I mean, and these these you know chief scientific officers are asking me questions, and I'm thinking like I'm not the right person. The problem is there's so few people on the human side who are talking about veterinary medicine that I'm sort of the I, by default I'm the person they call. But that that I'm hoping to change. Yeah. Great. Any more questions? Last chance. <laughs> before the break. So if there's one message that you would like to give your human colleagues, what would it be? Well, I mean, the first is um, that, A, that there's a lot to learn, that they should be open. By the way, some of it is, I, I do think human exceptionalism, I do think there is this idea that our diseases, we, we're special, so our diseases are special. There's that kind of thing. And these are not dumb people. These are, you know, these are people who have taken evolutionary biology, they know it, but they don't know it. But, but the, other, <laughs> the other thing is physicians like you guys, we're really, really busy. We're really, really stressed. We're really, really focused on what we're focused on. And I remember when I was giving those One Health lectures, and you know, we have, and I was looking at everybody in the audience, and they, everyone looked nervous because UCLA grand rounds are mandatory. So you have to sit there for an hour. So if you have, you know, 30 patients upstairs, and you have to sit, everyone's like this. You know, they're looking at their devices. They're, they want to. I decided I, need to I needed to make it relevant. I needed to make it relevant, and I needed to, and I think for physicians to be engaged with vet veterinary medicine, we have to have a proof of concept project, something that proves that you can't get from here to there without comparative medicine. I mean, one really exciting example is obesity. 
So there is such a big problem on the human side and apparently on the veterinary side with obesity. What is interesting to me is it's not just domestic, it's not just cats and dogs, it's also zoo animals, and there are even some wild populations that ecologists are describing having increased body masses. And what that does, it generates this hypothesis, could there be environmental factors like endocrine disrupting chemicals or antibiotic residue in the environment that's contributing not just to the human side but also to this animal, this plurality of obesity epidemics as it's called across species. So I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is that we'll never be able to generate that kind of hypothesis unless we have comparative information. So there's lots of juicy targets. I don't have the bandwidth to do it myself, but I would actually encourage you to, if you have an interest in this, come to one of our conferences or reach out to me and I'll help you organize your own conference. Um, this is my passion, this is my mission, and um, anyway, I'm grateful to be here today. So Thank that's you. wonderful, that's wonderful. And I just want to let you know, obviously you already know that there is a huge uh, One Health Obesity Conference between human and veterinary medicine at the end of this year in Atlanta with the CDC. So yep. the CDC is uh, organizing that. Okay, one more question and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. I was just wondering, do you have any plans on bringing these kind of talks in Europe? Um, thank you. Well, first of all, um, we were really excited that Utrecht University of, or it, Utrecht University, right? Not mm -hmm. University of Utrecht. Right. Utrecht University in the Netherlands has actually done two Zubiquity conferences, although unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. They've done one in Australia. They're planning one, I understand, in Japan. Um, we, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, these should, be, these should be happening wherever there is a veterinary school and the dean of a veterinary school who cares about One Health, which presumably they do, and a medical school. And if you have a vet school and a medical school, you can have a Zubiquity conference. And you know, it's slow growing. This is our sixth year. We always have more vets who get it than physicians. <laughs> We do, but we're working at it. We're reaching out to medical students who are more receptive than their senior you know, mentors, and we're reaching out to residents and interns. Great, so uh, to wrap it up, uh, you told me that uh, one of your favorite things to do is to hike in the mountains. Yeah. There's a couple of people here, they probably stay a little longer or have nothing to do on, uh, I think, Wednesday afternoon. What's the best hike to take? Oh, that's a good question. So um, if you drive Sunset, you take Sunset towards uh, the beach, right? There's a hike up, it's called Temescal Canyon, and you, you will hike right up to the top of the Santa Monica Mountains. It's like a moderate hike. If you go very early in the morning, I go about 5.30 in the morning, you'll see coyotes and um, it's, it's kind of amazing. You get to the top of the mountain, you can see the Pacific Ocean unless there's fog, Temescal Canyon. And not too many human beings at that time? Uh, no, no, not too many. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a big hand of applause for this wonderful speaker. Amazing. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.